Today I'll be talking about um, mobile apps and mobile, the mobile web actually, mobile web apps. And so as you know, mobile apps and the mobile web are sort of caught in a somewhat complex sim, uh, symbiosis. So there, there's, there's a lot of issues, a lot of tension uh, between those two. And um, for instance, you've all seen these kind of headlines, for instance, this one on TechCrunch, mobile app usage increases in 2014 as mobile web surfing declines, or even more uh, radical, the mobile browser is dead, long live the app, and so on. So you've all seen this, it's sort of always this fight between who will win, the apps or the, or the, or the web. And uh, it's a little bit dramatic, um, there's probably a place for both, uh, but this is, this is quite interesting and it's a, it's a complex playing field. And so you also see these kind of things uh, when you browse on the, you know, in, with a mobile web browser. Um, and you, it doesn't have to be Opera, it can be any, any mobile web browser. Because if you go to Pinterest, uh, it says, well, it works best if you switch to an Android-friendly app. That's strange because I just went to your website, so why do you send me away again? Um, the same for LinkedIn, for instance, they suggest you to download their app from Google Play, and then there's a really tiny continue to mobile site link, uh, which you may or may not click, but they prefer if you don't. So this is just some examples to show the, the complex situation we have on mobile. Um, and the reason for that is that the mobile web is great. It has a lot of uh, JavaScript engines have come a long way. Uh, we, we're in a much better state than we were uh, a number of years ago, but there's still a number of vital uh, functional bits that have been missing to make the mobile web on par with native apps. Um, so that, that has been a little bit the issue. And um, uh, however, there is good news uh, because it's changing quite quickly. And Within the next, I think right now already, we have a couple of these bits in place. And within the next uh, couple of months uh, to year, we'll see a lot more pieces of the puzzle falling together that will bring web apps closer, or the web platform as a whole, uh, closer to native apps and on par with native apps. And uh, empowering further the, the web platform, making it a good um, way to, to build applications uh, for mobile. Um, and so these these things, uh, the, the, the bits that, that need to fall in place, or that are slowly falling in place, are these four um, blocks, or, or I put them on cards, or pillars, or whatever you call them. Um, so it's offline, uh, device APIs, push notifications, and add to home screen. There's probably a couple more, but these are the ones I'll be talking about today. Uh, and so we'll go through them one by one. First of all, let's start with device APIs. You see I've got a nice stack of things there. Um, there is, uh, there's a number of device APIs that native apps have had access to for a long time, and now also, actually, uh, a lot of this stuff has landed in browsers, in web browsers. Geolocation has been there for quite a while. You can perfectly use geolocation um, inside uh, your web app, uh, fetch the, the user geolocation, and present him with relevant info for um, his location on the map or coffee shops around or things like that. Um, the same for device orientation. Um, you can make little games, for instance, that use the uh, motion sensors on the device and uh, uh, various other things. Um, media capture and streams is also known as WebRTC. Um, it allows you access to the camera and microphone uh, on the device, and so you can use that to build, uh, for instance, something like uh, Skype, but inside the web browser. There's, for instance, a very interesting Norwegian company called Appear.in. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, I recommend you check it out. It's really cool. It's a startup, and they made uh, basically a, a browser-based peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer communication tool uh, with, uh, with camera and video, and so with video and, and sound and everything. And uh, so it just uses URL, so you don't even need to have a username. Very powerful, just in the browser. It works great on mobile as well, uh, so it's uh, really exciting. Uh, battery API is something that is probably... Uh, only on Firefox right now, I believe. It's not yet landed in Chromium um, or in other browsers. And uh, so that, for instance, would allow you to pull the, the state of your battery, how much is left, and connect uh, actions or activities to that. And then the Vibration API, I was, it was actually, to my surprise, I checked it out uh, when preparing this, uh, this talk, and I found that it works really nicely uh, in Chromium-based browsers, uh, Firefox as well, um, possibly others. I haven't tested everywhere. And so it allows you, for instance, to connect a little uh, vibration to when you tap uh, a button, for instance, on the screen, or, or maybe for games, this can be interesting, and so on. So exciting possibilities that were only there for native apps before come already to the web, and they're quite established. 
There is a talk, though, to <coughs> limit these APIs because they're very fairly privacy sensitive. Geolocation is obvious. Device orientation is actually also privacy sensitive because it could be used to track whether you're moving or standing and, and so on. Um, WebRTC, of course, and so on. So the, the question is that um, uh, it would be a good idea. So the, there are some voices that say, okay, we should maybe limit this to HTTPS only, and probably that's a good idea. So you might see, there's still discussion going on, uh, but we might see move, these APIs uh, moving to be only available on HTTPS enabled sites. All right, let's move on um, to offline. Uh, so for offline support, um, if you have native apps, they work really great offline, or at least some of them work great offline. You can still continue using them if you enter the tube. Uh, games were mentioned earlier. There's also other examples. Pocket, for instance, has built its whole app concept around being offline and reading it later and so on and so on. Um, so that's, uh, that's a quite well-established concept already on, on native apps. Um, but on, on the web, we only had app cache. And app cache is okay-ish at first sight, but then uh, Jake Archibald, he's been uh, going around conferences and wrote also this very important article, application cache is a douchebag. Uh, so, and pointing out that actually it's so complex to use, one use once you start really using it on a production site uh, that it's absolutely um, uh, almost impossible to work with. So that's not an option, so we need something else. And that something else um, is also something that Jake has been pushing really hard for and is, is being... Uh, um, developed uh, by many people in the, in the Chromium team um, and, and also other browser vendors are involved as well. Uh, and that is service workers. And service workers, um, I stole this from, the, uh, from their GitHub page, the, the spec page, um, and it, it, because it's a really good, ex really good explanation of what service workers are. They're event-driven scripts that run independently of web pages, so they continue running even if the browser is closed or anything like that. And uh, they have scriptable caches. So along with the ability to respond to network requests from certain web pages by a script, this provides a way for applications to really go offline. So you, have a, a, you can really script the offline behavior of your app, which is very powerful and very interesting to do, and so it gives us much more options than app cache, which is a douchebag. So um, we tried this out. Oh yeah, also worth uh, mentioning here that you need to, you can only use this over HTTPS. So this is also in line with what I said earlier, that service workers is one of these new APIs that's only available over HTTPS. So we've been trying this out on DevOpera, uh, our developer site. And um, as you see, we sometimes have articles with catchy titles. <laughs> Um, and so what we tried here is something very simple. Uh, this is just a first version, but we wanted to make a really simple service worker, like what is the simplest one we can make, basically. Um, and what we did there is when the user loads, uh, goes offline, uh, I'll show you that in a second. So here we go. Go offline, turn on airplane mode, refresh the page. We are going to keep some of the navigational elements, but instead we show a text that shows that you are offline. Show this one more time in case you missed it. <coughs> Just look up from your computer right now. So go offline and then uh, we refresh the page. We keep the main navigation elements, but instead of showing the, the default browser page, like, hey, it looks like you're disconnected, we show something else. Okay, um, so this is uh, one of the things uh, we've, been, uh, we've been playing around with and it's quite an interesting technology. Let's look at some of the code bits because this is JavaScript conference after all, so let's look at some JavaScript. Um, we are, first of all, uh, in the, towards the bottom of the page, you register your service worker. Um, and so it's referenced there in a file, service worker JS, so let's have a look at what's in there. Um, first of all, I, we declare the offline cache and the error page that we're going to use. And then uh, we have to use a polyfill because service worker cache is not completely implemented in, in Chromium yet. So we need um, to uh, use this polyfill to actually make it, uh, make it work properly. Uh, we don't let our service worker kick in until all these resources are cached. And then these is, this is the list of resources we're going to cache. Uh, and once these are cached, then we let the service worker start. And if you go to the second part of the code, uh, what we're basically doing is that we're proxying all the HTML page requests to the, through the service worker. Um, and it's basically the service worker that responds instead of the web server, passes it on and, and so on. And so it, it sort of isn't, the service worker is in the middle 
uh, as, a, as a sort of proxy, I found that once this was explained to me as, oh, it's kind of functioning like a proxy, it made a lot more sense, uh, the, whole, the whole system. Um, and if an HTML page cannot be fetched, then the catch kicks in. So this is all promise-based. Um, uh, it uses prom service workers uses promises. And so you have this catch that kicks in, an error page, and the cache resources are returned instead of our HTML page. And other requests are also proxied to the service worker. This is a really quick example. You can find it out online. All the source code of DevOpera is also on GitHub. So if you are interested, go and check it out. So uh, this is service worker. Then uh, add to home screen. Um, and this is quite exciting. We just released a build two days ago on, uh, on DevOpera. Um, it's a labs build, an experimental build, but it will land soon in the, in the main product as well, in the main uh, uh, Opera product as well. And so what it is, is basically, you will see what happens. I load it here, Dev Opera, and I click on the plus sign, and I click on Add to Home Screen. You'll see an icon appear there. When I click this icon, um, the uh, Dev Opera website is shown, but without browser UI. It actually runs as its own instance, uh, even in the, in the task switcher. So, and it, it runs sort of as a, stand, as a standalone version of Dev Opera without all the browser uh, UI around it. Quite interesting, and you see that it brings web apps, it makes them break out of the browser onto the home screen, and it gives immediately a totally different experience. You don't need to first go to your browser and then click on a bookmark to open a web page, but instead you click right away uh, on the home screen to launch the application. This is also available in Chrome, um, and so we're quite excited about this. Hopefully it will come to other browsers soon as well. Um, let me see here, is this one more time? Yeah, I'll show you one more time. So add to the home screen, click add, there we go. And when you click it, you launch the application. So if you click on links inside the same domain, you will still say in the app, once you click on a link that goes to an external site, uh, you will actually launch the um, page back into the normal browser. This is to avoid confusion uh, to the user to, so that he knows that he's not confused about which context he is in. Uh, because, of course, there might be a malicious site that tries to prevent, uh, pretend that it's another site. So it's important there that you see it in the, in the web browser with a proper URL bar and um, a padlock and so on, and it's safe. Okay. Um, how do we do this? Uh, this is uh, also you need HTTPS. Important to point out, I tried to make a couple of demos, and then I saw, oh, of course, I was using HTTP. It must be HTTPS, so keep that in mind. You have a manifest, uh, .web manifest file in the head section of the page. And um, of your site, and this is sort of what's in this manifest. Um, very simple, some declarative um, uh, markup. It's JSON, JSON basically. Uh, you can define a name for uh, the shortcut uh, or a short name. This is useful for screens with really limited uh, real estate, very small screens. You have a shorter version of your name. Then you define an icon, uh, icons. You can define multiple ones for several densities and so on. We just defined one here, just to keep it simple. Then you can define a start URL. This is useful. Imagine you're on DevOpera, you click through to some articles and say, oh, I like this site. I want to add it to my home screen. Uh, and you would add it there. Uh, then you actually add the root. So because that's probably where you want to go. This is where, this is where the app experience or the web app experience sort of starts. So you can define there uh, whatever page you want to, um, uh, you, the, the user to start from. This can also be used, for instance, if you add a slash question mark equals something something. Um, you can use that to sort of track how many people are actually visiting uh, your, uh, well, adding your site to their home screen and visiting it from there. Then, um, display is quite interesting as well. You have, for instance, the standalone option. Um, there is also full screen. You see it's more immersive. It even hides the top and the bottom uh, OS navigation bar. A browser will bring you back to the normal web browser view and minimal UI. We haven't implemented anything there yet, but it falls back to the browser UI. It's also worth mentioning that sites that do not have a manifest can also be added to the home screen, but they will by default launch in this browser UI. Um, so uh, it's not just limited to, uh, to sites that have this manifest in place. The user users will be able to add anything to their home screen, but stuff with a manifest will look prettier and will have this more immersive mode. You also get some orientation options. Orientation any is pretty obvious, both portrait and landscape. 
Then there's a portrait option, locks it in portrait mode and landscape, which will do something like this when you launch it. I change step up right here a bit to launch in landscape mode, and there you see it immediately shows it in landscape mode. All right, um, moving on. Uh, this is uh, a little interesting bit also, the display and orientation bits in the manifest directly relate to uh, display mode and orientation media queries. So you can use these media queries to, uh, for instance, define a design that is optimized for full screen landscape or for standalone or whatever combination you want to use and optimize their experience, maybe show some uh, extra navigation buttons or, or what, what have you, maybe instructions on how to get out of full screen, for instance. So you can use this to uh, conditionally show uh, and alter your content. There is a good uh, and interesting spec that you may want to read, or maybe not, I'm not sure. Uh, go and check it out on, um, on GitHub. It is there. And there's lots of questions remaining about this. Uh, once we implemented this, we found out, okay, there's so many things we still need to solve. For instance, should we show the user a prompt when they visit the site with a manifest, or after how many times? For instance, I believe Chrome right now has an implementation where if you visit it a second uh, consecutive day or something like that, then they will show you, hey, you visited this site twice already, do you want to maybe add it to your home screen? Maybe that's too intrusive, maybe we need something else, maybe we need a subtle hint uh, that, hey, this site can be added to the home screen, but you don't have to, we're not going to prompt you to and ask you to make a decision. So quite interesting. Uh, do we need a web app store is also a good question. Should users just find anything on the web or is there some sort of curation, cur curation necessary? Um, what is adding to home screen? Is it the same as installing or is installing something on a system even, should it go even deeper than that? Uh, so all these are remaining questions that we still have to figure out. Uh, so looking forward to, to working on that uh, over the next months and discussing with various people. If you have ideas, send them my way. And then the last bit, uh, push notifications. Push notifications are coming to the web as well. This is not landed yet in Opera, so I'm showing a, a demo in Chrome right now. You see here, if you enable push notifications and you click on this button in the middle, uh, after a while there will be a push notification that is sent to the OS. There it is. What's the weather like in London? So when you pull it down, you click it, you can see what the weather looks like. Um, so this is quite interesting. I'll show it one more time. I'll say something in the meantime. It's quite interesting, but it allows you, because it allows you to send notifications about a, web, about a, a website. Uh, for instance, there's a news item, there's a new blog post. You got a new message maybe on a web-based uh, instant messaging client. Uh, and it allows you to, even if the browser is not running, to say, hey, there's something new. You know, maybe you want to go and check it out. This is something that native apps have been able to do for quite a while. Um, but it's really exciting that this is also coming to the web. So we're working on implementing this. It's not there yet, but we hope to have it within a couple of months. So fingers crossed. And, um, of course, I hope that it comes to other browsers soon as well. There's also a spec there. Push API is based on service workers, uh, and it also requires HTTPS. So these are sort of the, the building blocks that I think uh, are very crucial uh, to bring the web to the next level. They're coming to browsers uh, really uh, quickly, and so we're very excited about it. Um, and hope to see and look forward to see what you uh, will do with it and how you will use it and how we can improve things better. So that was me and now uh, Martin will be talking about Manifold JS and other things. So the stage is Martin. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.